Okay, let's try that. There we go. We have power. How's everybody doing this morning? Like three of you are excited. Praise God. I am so excited. First off, I want to thank Pastor Adam for this opportunity. Listen, for a senior pastor to allow a youth pastor to speak on the stage is very dangerous. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, it's an honor. <laughs> um, and I'm excited. How many of you, uh, matter of fact, let's start with this. Let's pray if you would join me. Father, we just thank you for your word, God. Lord, we love you so much. And we're so honored to be in your house, in your presence, God. Lord, I ask as, as you bring this word through me this morning, God, that you would let every word that I would say fall harmlessly to the ground. But Holy Spirit, every word that you would speak to our hearts, let it pierce to the depth of who we are, that we would receive what you have for each one of us today. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name, amen, amen, and amen. So by a show of hands, how many of you want to be used by God? Okay, so that's 98%. Praise God. I think a couple of them are still asleep. But, uh, you know, we all have this desire. Once you come to Christ, it's natural for you to have the desire to be used by God. So this morning, I want to kind of give you a self-survey. Anybody ever do the self-survey? Is like the spiritual gifts assessment where you check, you know, what you are more likely to do. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how, how much do you want to be used by God? Um, if you're down around a one, you're not going to be wanting to use to God by God at all because it might cost you something. You might have to do something. You might have to turn off the TV. You might have to turn off your video game. You might have to, whatever it is that you do that's not serving God, you might have to, you know, not do that to serve God, uh, to be used by God. A 10 means that you're ready to sell the house, sell the car, sell the dog, sell the cat, sell the cat. Anybody get that? Sell the cat, get rid of the kids, and move to the most remote desert village in the middle of nowhere to tell them about Jesus. If we're honest, most of us are going to be around a four or a five. God used me, but not too much. God used me, but uh, don't let it cost me too much because, you know, I, I kind of like this little thing over here. Uh, and, and, you know, I got my little nest egg over here. I don't want to have to give that away, God, because I know, God, you tend to cause people to, to you know, just give stuff away, you know, and... In the New Testament, we look at the book of Acts, we see that it was so common for people to give away their stuff to bless other people that there were no needs in the body of Christ. Let me repeat that because somebody didn't get it. There were no needs. Nobody had a need. Everybody groceries, if there was a light bill, everybody's light bill was paid, everybody was taken care of, there was no elderly that didn't have food, there was no lonely widows, there were no orphans without homes, is anybody getting this? Okay, so they were doing what they were called to do somewhere over the last 2,000 years, I think we missed the mark a little bit. Okay, so when we go back and we look at the, the, the church at its birth, we see that they were a giving people. And I, I know some of y'all just hit a wall. Some of y'all are like, oh man, Pastor Matt's going to talk about tithing. Yes, I probably will talk about tithing before I'm done today. But that is not the, 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 the primary uh, center of this message. The primary center of this message is exactly what the title is, which isn't up there. Um, it's all of me. Somebody say all of me. Okay, did I say some of me? Did I say a little bit of me? No, when we go to God, we give all of me. And sometimes when we say all, we don't realize what that encompasses. Sometimes we're like, ah, a little bit. Maybe this, but not this. How many of y'all would be brave and admit there are things in your life that you hold on to that you have not given to God? Okay. Good, praise God. I'm, I'm glad I came to the right place this morning because I was afraid I turned to the wrong church. You know, praise God. We all have things that we kind of like, yeah, God, you can have my finances. No problem. I'll get my finances because I got plenty of it in the bank. God, you can have all my time. Well, except for the bit, little bit of time that I'm watching TV, you know, between 5 and 1030 at night. Hmm. Or like myself, you know, I like to play video games. I know pastor would be like, man, any man that stays up all night. Well, listen, I like to play video games. It's my unwind, okay? But it's not my primary thing. It's not the thing that I stick to to get all of my fulfillment. How many of y'all want to be fulfilled in life? Let's be honest. Like, like you want to, like at the end of your life, you want to look back and go, man, I had a full life. Well, I'm going to take you to a story real quick about Jesus because I think for us to have a full life, we have to kind of be like Jesus. How many of y'all would agree with that? You know, the more 
you want to succeed in life, the more you want to be fulfilled in life. Because see, the world would tell you that a fat bank account, a big house, a nice car, the boat that you want, hint, hint, um, all of these things will be fulfilling and you'll be able to look back over your life and be fulfilled. Do you know how many millionaires there are that are empty? That feel so, like they just feel like their life is, they've got money in the bank, they got the car in the driveway, they got the boat that's dry docked over at the place where they just call ahead and say, hey, drop it in, right? So, and, and, but they look at their life and they go, I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm not productive. Anybody ever have one of those days where you've got all these plans in the morning time, you get up and you're like, I ain't got it today. And then you realize about halfway through the day, you're like, oh man, I was not productive. I got to get up and do something, right? Well, there's this story of Jesus. And it's one of my favorite stories in the, in, in the New Testament. Jesus is gone to Samaria, right? And, and he runs into this Samaritan woman. Now, mind you, Jesus was Jew and this woman was a Samaritan. First off, they're not supposed to talk to each other. Kind of seems like a little bit of our society today, doesn't it? Right? They're not supposed to talk to each other. They're not allowed. Hey, you can't have a car because the Samaritans are dogs. They're garbage. Matter of fact, I think Jesus even called a Samaritan woman a dog at one point. And his, y'all go read it if you don't believe me. He was like, he's like, it's not for the, the, the masters uh, or the children's bread to be given to the dogs. And I'm like, whoa, Jesus was, y'all know Jesus was kind of rough. He, was, he wasn't always the Jesus we see today portrayed in a lot of places. Listen, <laughs> Jesus wasn't the one that's always like, oh, honey, it's okay. You felt it. Sometimes he's like, get up off your butt and let's do this thing, right? At least that's how I imagine Jesus. Not this frail, little, sweet. I mean, I'm sure he had his moments where he was nice, especially when the children were around. But when it came to his disciples, he wasn't always like, oh, it's okay, Peter. You messed up again. He was like, hey, how many times do I have to tell you, right? So Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. She realizes that he's the son of God. They have this great dialogue. But the part I want to get to is after their dialogue. He sends her away into the city. She goes to tell everybody about the Messiah, how he's come, how he's come and prophesied to her at the well. But there's this thing that happens afterwards. In John chapter 4, we'll start in verse 27. It says, just then the disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water of jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can y'all imagine that? You meet Jesus and he reads your mail. He's like, do you remember that time that you, yeah, yeah, I remember. Can we not talk about that? And so she says, you told me everything that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Now, in the meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. <laughs> Did somebody slip Jesus a happy meal? <laughs> the disciples are perplexed. They're like, what? He says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has, has anyone brought him food to, or something to eat? And Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, if we're being like Jesus and we say, my job, my calling, my thing, the thing that is going to fulfill me is not all the, the material wealth of the world. It's to do the will of God. And sometimes we, we blank out. We're like, man, I don't even know what the will of God is for my life. I don't know what God has called me to do. Well, there's some areas you can start. And you've heard this preached by our pastors time and time again. You, God's given us some things. Somebody say things. God's given us some things to be able to use, to bless others, to bless God, to be a part. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I want God to use me in the miraculous. I remember when I got saved, man, I would hear, these people over in other countries. I had an uncle that was a minister in Peru, and I'd always hear these stories about people getting healed and saved and set free. And over in Africa, there was deliverance. I mean, just amazing services, millions of people coming to Christ, getting set free from the bondage they had been in. And I'm like, man, I want to, got me? Hello? Put me in, coach. I'm here. 
right? Anybody else? You're like, God, why is it I see so-and-so being used in miracles, but I'm over here and I'm not? See, there's some things that God gave us. He gave us a few things that I think are detrimental to be used in the miraculous. So let's go with those real quick. Our time, their time, talent, treasure, and testimony. Okay, I know that if you've been here for any period of time, you have heard those, those terms. Time, talent, treasure, and testimony. Those are the things that God has given us to be used in the miraculous. Well, sometimes I don't feel like I'm miraculous. Well, sometimes you're not miraculous. Let's just be honest. Let's be honest. Sometimes we're just rotten to the core. I mean, Jesus said there's none good among us save the Father, right? He said, welcome to Freedom Destiny. Where's our job to make you feel better about yourself? Right? So uh, here's the thing is, is, is sometimes we're not in the miraculous. Why? Because we're not positioning ourselves to be used in the miraculous. Listen, I don't care how down you are or how far out you are. God can put you in a position to be used in the miraculous. When we do this, we say, all of me, God. Say all of me. That means my time, my talent, my treasure. My so I'm going to break these down real quick. Time. If we think about it, if we're honest with ourselves, I don't need you to be honest with each other this morning, I need you to be honest with yourself, we don't effectively use our time all the time. What does that mean? That means, when was, let me ask you this, when was the last time you went to a, an elderly home that shut in because they can't get out due to our current situation? When was the last time you visited, when was the last time you sat down with a homeless person on the side of the road? The pastor, they might be crazy. They might be, that just means you'll get to heaven faster, Okay? When was the last time you actually took money out of your pocket and bought somebody lunch? Well, pastor, they might use it for alcohol. So what if they do? That's not your problem. That's their problem. If they're going to use God's, if they're going to squander God's blessing, that's their problem. Okay, when was the last time you called, reached out to somebody that you haven't seen in a while and said, hey, I was just thinking about you. Listen, I don't know how many times that phone call has brought me off a cliff. In 20 years of serving God, listen, if you've been in ministry for any period of time, and we were just talking about it backstage, where you've been in ministry, for, you get jaded, you get hurt, you get broken, you get, there's things that happen to ministers that, 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 that make you go, why did I sign up for this mess? You know, if we're honest, when was the last time you sent your pastor an email or you uh, called the church office and said, hey, pastor, I'm praying for you today. He may not even get to talk to you, but he'll know that you're praying for him. When was the last time that you did something for somebody that didn't benefit you? you that got really quiet suddenly. Whoa. <laughs> that, I got one amen out of that. I'm like, oh, I touched somebody's toes. Listen, when was the last time you did something for somebody that didn't benefit you? You know, one of the greatest things you can do with your time is to do something for somebody that cannot do something for you. Somebody would get that on the way home. They'd be like, Whoa. That's revelational. No, that's scriptural. Your talent. Maybe you're not an artist. Listen, I watch my 17-year-old draw, and I'm like, so jealous. I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. If I'd stuck with drawing when I was younger, when I was her age, I probably could. But when I draw, it kind of looks a little like stick figures, squiggly ones on top of that. You're like, you know, maybe you can't sing. Maybe when you sing, you sound like a broken bird. I love you, you know. You're like, yeah, I'm so off key that the band's going, well, I wish they'd quit singing. Thank God he said, make a joyful noise. Maybe you're not talented in that way, but I bet you've got some sort of talent. The, matter of fact, the thing that you are talented with might be the thing that somebody else in this sanctuary needs to get where they're going. You might be holding on to your talent going, I don't know how to use this for God. Just start using it. And then ask God, what do you want me to do with it? What do you want me to do with it? I've got this talent. Listen, I am not a talented artist. I'm not the best singer. I've got a few talents. I can fix anything with an engine and four wheels. That doesn't mean call me this week and say, Pastor Matt, my car is broke down because I'm going to be like, take it to the shop. I don't do it anymore. But when God tells me to use that talent, I use that talent. And you know what? I've never used in the talent that God's given me that somebody else didn't get blessed. Now, I didn't always get blessed from it until I saw them get blessed. Because there's something about when you bless somebody with the talent that God goes, oh my gosh, my child, you're doing what I want you to do. Let me fill you up. Let me give you some. It may not be monetary. It might not be. They might not even say thank you. But when you see them 
blessed by the talent that God's given you. You're like, whoa. Your treasure, yes, treasure. What does that mean? Is it all about this? No. And listen, I'm not talking about your tithe. Your tithe should be automatic. Your tithe should be given. I'm talking about above and beyond. What does that mean? That means you see somebody hungry. Maybe you ain't got cash. What is it? I bet you got some denty more in the cupboard. I bet you got some spaghetti noodles and some spaghetti sauce. Go make them a meal. I'm talking about your treasures, the things that you possess. Going back to what I said at the beginning in the Old Testament in Acts, we see that if somebody in the church had need, somebody would go sell their property. That's what it says. It says that somebody would go and sell their property to make sure that that person got taken care of, your treasure. When you give your treasure to God, I, I, I used to have this really awesome Scottish pastor years ago, and his favorite phrase was, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, Right? Well, if we have access to everything that Jesus has access to because we're seated with him in heavenly places, then what's your treasure? Your treasure is heavenly treasure. You've got treasure that you don't even realize you have access to. Somebody's like, all right, tell me how to get that. I'm working on it. We give of our treasure because you cannot, by any means... Out give God. Well, pastor, I don't have two pennies to rub together. Well, you know, I remember Jesus stopping the tithe processional at the synagogue because the lady gave two mites, which is equivalent to about a quarter of a penny today's money, if I remember correctly. Two mites. I mean, these people are walking up throwing in bags of money because they thought that the blessing came from being heard, giving their offering. And this lady walks up nice and meekly and drops her two little mites into the offering plate. And Jesus goes, whoa, wait a minute. Ronnie, did you see how much she gave? And they're all like, I just gave thousands. And you're excited about two mites? Yes, because it wasn't about the amount. It was about the heart behind it. We give of our treasure. We give of our testimony. I say, do you want to be used by God? And you're like, pastor, you don't know what I've done. I know what I've done. And if God can use this guy... Hello? Hello? God can use anybody if he can use me. And listen, since I came to Christ in 2000, I've seen amazing things God has done. Not because of me, but in spite of me. Why? Because I was willing to share that I used to be an almost alcoholic. I say almost because God delivered me, and apparently uh, you're not allowed to be delivered, but I think that's hogwash. I think God can deliver anybody of any addiction they've got. How do I know that? Because God's delivered me of addictions. God's delivered me of stuff I've done in my past, uh, of soul ties that I used to hold on to. God's delivered me of stupidity on many occasions. Not always. Why? Because I'm willing to share my testimony. I'm willing to let you know. Listen, there's a story in the Bible about a guy in a cemetery running around naked. He's running around naked in the cemetery. You don't believe me? Go read it. Some of y'all are like, man, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I need to go read this thing. There's really cool stories about Jesus shows up on the shore in a boat and he's like, I don't know what you want, but get away from me. Jesus cast the demons out. And there were so many, their name was Legion. Now, if you want to talk, and, and, and part of the story, it says, and all the people of the town knew him. And when they tried to bind him, he would break every binding. He would get, and he'd run around naked. Some of you are all like, man, I need to go there. But what happened was everybody knew about his mess. Everybody knew about his sin. Everybody knew about the, the things that he did while, under, while he was under this demonic possession. And when Jesus set him free, Jesus gets in the boat because all the people there are like, whoa, he commanded demons, you got to leave. Apparently they had a lot of trash they didn't want nobody to know about. But, but he gets in the boat and the man goes, let me go with you, Jesus. Because a lot of us, when we get saved, we get set free. We just want to go where Jesus is, right? Jesus said, I want you to go back home. And on your way home, I want you to tell everybody you encounter what God has done for you. He said, go use your testimony. Here it is. God, you once were bound. Now you're free. Go tell everybody. There was 10 towns between where he was and his home. Imagine how many people he had to encounter and go, Pastor Tom... 
I was in sin, man. Listen, the Bible says confess your sin. Sometimes the very thing that God delivered you from or brought you through is the very thing somebody else needs to know about. Listen, you're walking through hell, keep walking, but tell somebody else. Be like, look what God brought me through. Not because of you, but in spite of you. Because sometimes when God delivers you out of or through a situation, somebody else is going through that exact same thing. I hate to break your heart, folks. Whatever you go through is not for you. Whatever you go through is because God wants to use your testimony to set somebody else free. Somebody didn't get that. What you're going through is not for you. It's because God wants to use your testimony, what you've walked through, what you've been through, what he set you free from, the struggle that you've faced so that you can help somebody else get free. Listen, sometimes you want to lead people out and sometimes you just want to grab them them and shake them, right? Anybody else ever run into that person? Listen, I've done a lot of counseling over the last several years and and one of the things that drives me nuts is when you you counsel somebody and you're like, okay, this is how you get free. You give them the plan A, B, C, all the way to Z and then they come back two weeks later and they're like, I'm still struggling with the same thing. Well, did you do what we said and talked about last night? No. Well, then why am I going to tell you something new? Listen, I'm giving you the key to be used in the miraculous today. Your testimony can be a miraculous thing to somebody who needs to hear it. Somebody's going to get that later. Like, oh. So how many of y'all, I'm going to ask you, how many of y'all want to be fulfilled? Right? I want to be fulfilled. When I look back over my life, I don't want to be like, oh, he was a good preacher. I want to be like, oh, he he loved his family. No, I don't mind those things being said, but when I, I look back over my life, I want it to be, he used everything he had. He led nothing. Anybody ever play sports? There's that old phrase, leave nothing on the field. Leave, leave it all out there, man. When I finished my race, I wanted it to be because I ran it so hard, I, I just tuckered out at the end, man. As I crossed that finish line, right? I want to be able to say, look back and say, yes, I used my time, my talent, my testimony, my treasure. Because guess what? None of it really belongs to us, anyhow. See, God fulfills us when we go about his business and mind our own. I'm going to get on a little bit of a rant here. Is that okay if I get on a rant for just a moment? Listen, I, I, I have a Facebook account. I have an Instagram account. I even have a TikTok account. I don't spend much time on any of them. Why? Because I'm so busy. I'm so tired of looking at these things. Okay, so I'm not going to lie. TikTok is the devil. Don't start watching it because you'll get caught up in it. You'll be like, two hours later, you're like, where did the time go? I'm not using your time right. But I get so tired of seeing Christians attack Christians because somebody popped their opinion out there and somebody else didn't agree with it. Jesus didn't say that you would be known by your being right. He said you'd be known by your love one for another, right? You By your love. Is it love to call somebody out on, on social media and be like, hey, dummy, what's wrong with you? You're wrong. No. You see something wrong and you don't agree with it? Talk to them in private. That's what the Bible says. Talk to them in private. See, God wants to use you and he's not asking for much. Just your everything. I know it drives me nuts when I hear ministers get up and they're like, all you have to do is just love Jesus, and everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be all right. Not going to have any more trouble. Obviously, he's serving a different Jesus than I am. Because last I checked, serving Jesus, following Jesus, was never meant to be easy. It was never meant to be safe. It was never meant to be uh, sanitized. How many of you realize we live in a world that we've sanitized Christianity? Here's what Jesus said, if you want to be my follower. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, starts as this. Says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Listen, 
I don't know if y'all caught what Jesus was saying there. He said, listen, it's not going to cost you a whole lot to follow me. It's just going to cost you everything. You know, we, we like to, to hear that it's, it's a pain-free Walgreens world gospel. What's that mean? That means everything's perfect, everything's okay. How many of you would say that you struggle sometimes? I mean, if we're all honest, really, if there's things that we struggle sometimes. We, sometimes we fight with our spouses. Except for me and Heather, we never fight. We just have strong negotiations. Right? Um, you know, we struggle sometimes with past hurts, past regrets, past sins, things that creep up out of nowhere and are like, hello, I'm here again. You know? Jesus said, I, if you want to follow me, I'm going I'm to try to, he said, if you want to follow me, you must die. Now, not too many of us signed up and ran to the altar when the pastor said, if you want to follow Jesus, come up here and die. Because we want to think that because we're following Jesus, everything's going to be hunky-dory. Everything's going to be smooth, smooth sailing, nothing but blue skies do I see, right? But following Jesus was never meant to be easy or safe. In fact, it's a bloody mess. We have sanitized the bloodiness that bought us into salvation so much so that a lot of people won't even talk about the blood of Christ. When you talk about the blood of Christ, it makes demons shake. They're like, whoa, they're talking about that powerful stuff again. How do we know that the blood of Jesus is powerful? Because it washes us. See, listen, in the Old Testament, when they had offerings, when they, they, they sacrificed the lambs and the goats and the sheep and the birds and the turtles and whatever else they sacrificed, the blood was to cover the sins. But we were bought into a brand new covenant with God that now by the blood of the lamb, somebody say the lamb. Okay, make sure y'all are still awake. When, when we're bought into the new covenant by the blood of the lamb, we're washed clean. It doesn't cover our sins. How many of y'all had sins in the past? Right? How many of you think you might sin every now and then now? If you got kids, you sin, I promise. It's one of the ways we know Jesus definitely wasn't married because he never sinned. I'm going to get in trouble for that one later. But we see that, that it washes us clean and white as snow. Y'all remember that song we used to sing, Oh Precious, is that? Yeah. I'm not going to sing it. I'm, I'm doing y'all that favor. I'm not going to sing. I don't want to clear out the sanctuary quite yet. But we've got to unsanitize because when we unsanitize, we realize that there's sacrifice involved with being used by God. Sometimes you've got to give some stuff up. Sometimes you've got to let some stuff go. Uh, and, and listen, when you're doing it for God, it's no longer a sacrifice. It's a joy. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. It's, it becomes that moment. Listen, in Acts chapter 2, it says that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power to be a witness. Guess what that means? That means you're a witness in all things, not just going out on the street going, hey, do you know Jesus? It's a witness in how you live, how you talk, how you breathe, how you love, how you move, and how you use the things God's given you. Now, we started out talking about a story about Jesus. Now, I want to talk about a, a, another story that just, it's a wild story. It's about heavenly fish sandwiches. I love heavenly fish sandwiches because how many of you ever think when you're talking to yourself or you're talking to God about being used by God, you're thinking, what I have is not enough. I'm not worthy to be used. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, there's moments where you're like, I know me and I know what I've done and I know where my hangups are. I know where my holdups are. I know where my uh-ohs are, right? Anybody else have uh-ohs? You got uh-ohs. Everybody's got uh-ohs in their closet, right? And I know that if I start to be used by God, somebody's going to know that I used to do this thing and it's going to come out. So what if it does? So what if it does? Or maybe you're, you're like, God's telling me I need to give, but I looked in my bank account and it says, uh-uh. <laughs> Financial Peace University. Shameless plug. There you go. Get plug Listen, Heather and I are going because sometimes we struggle. And sometimes I look at my bank account and it goes, what are you doing? Right? And God's telling me to go give 
money to somebody, and I'm like, what? <laughs> right, God. But it seems like it's not enough. And then when you do it, all of a sudden you're like, where'd that extra hundred bucks come from? Or you're like, wow, where did that extra blessing come from? It may not be monetary. It might be something else. Listen, sometimes I go into places and I get like free coffee or something. Hey, that's a blessing. That's like, I don't know what I did back here to get God to bless me over here, but I'll take it. See, we see Jesus. Now, how many of you have ever sat under a preacher? I'm hoping I'm not being that one today. Where they just went on and on and on and on and on and on. They started preaching at 11 by like 3 o'clock. You're like, all right, well, the roast in the oven is burnt now, pastor. Thank you. Well, Jesus had one of those moments. He just found out that his favorite cousin had been beheaded at the behest of a man's wife. I won't go into that story because that's a story for another time. But, but imagine this. You're, you're, you're ministering, and somebody comes to you and says, Hey, listen, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but your favorite cousin, John, well, his head was delivered to Herod's wife on a platter. What's that mean? That means he's dead. He ain't coming back. He's dead, dead, right? So imagine Jesus being 100% man, 100% God, had every feeling, every emotion that we deal with. So I'm sure he was sad. And this is one of the few miracles that is recorded in every gospel. That's why I think this thing's so awesome and so, so powerful. So we're going to buzz through all four accounts really quickly. In Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place. What did he hear? He heard that John died. To a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot. I'm not sure they walked across the water. So that means they traveled a long way to get back to Jesus because they had to go around instead of through, right? Yeah, you know, that, that's kind of a side note. The Holy Spirit just said that sometimes we do have to go around instead of through. Sometimes that thing in front of you is put there because God wants you to encounter something else on the way around it, okay? I don't know who that was for, but somebody needed that this morning. It goes on to say, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, when, the evening, when, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Now, now you've been hanging out with Jesus all day. He's been healing the sick, and he's been ministering. He's been talking to people. He's been doing what Jesus does, right? And, and, and you realize that the congregation's gotten hungry. You're like, listen, pastor, rabbi, teacher, Jesus, I don't know if you've realized this, but the sun's starting to go down. The day's over, and you've been talking all day. Well, I'll say, we just give them a break. Let them go home. And eat, or go to the local villages and find food. And Jesus looks at you and says, what you got? Why don't you feed them? Imagine that moment of dismay of looking at Jesus like, hey guys, Jesus has lost his mind again. And he goes on to say this, he says, and he said to them, he says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. You know the rest of the story. He blessed them. He broke them. He gave them out. It says, after the people had eaten, they had 12 baskets. I think the disciples all needed a doggy bag. Right? Had 12 baskets left over. In Mark, we see it again in chapter 6, verse 35. It says, and when it grew late, that his disciples said to him, this is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages. And we go on down to, to verse 37. He says, you give them something to eat. Again, we see this, this recurring theme. Uh, two, two gospels now, we've seen the same thing. Now we go on over to Luke, chapter 9, verse 12. He says, now the day began to wear away, and the 12 came and said, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages, countryside, for we are here in a desolate place. He says, you give them something to eat. 
And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Where are we to go to buy food? They, I mean, they're, they're asking an honest question. They're like, listen, we got barely enough to feed you. Because you've been preaching all day, and I know when you preach all day, you get hungry, right? Actually, he didn't because he was always fulfilled by doing the will of God. He said, we only got a couple sandwiches here. I'm from Middleburg. We say sandwiches, not sandwiches. We just got a couple fish sandwiches. What are we supposed to do? It's not enough for 5,000 people. What is wrong with you, Jesus? You've lost your mind. Did God ever tell you to do something and you think, <laughs> right. I remember when God called me to preach. And God had been speaking to me, but I was ignoring it. Anybody else ever ignore God? Like, I was ignoring God. I was steadfast. I was, I was like, no, 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 no. And I remember a lady in the church came to me. She says, Matthew, when are you going to, uh, you know, God's calling you to preach. I'm like, <laughs> Miss Mary, you've lost your mind. You and God both. Y'all are on the same drugs, I guess. I don't know. But I can't speak in front of people. Like, I get physically ill when I speak in front of more than two people, and they got to be family at that. And so another dear sister comes to me about two months later. She goes, Matthew, when are you going to stop arguing with God and preach? I'm like, you, Miss Mary, and God need to go have a conversation because you're talking about the wrong Matthew. I think you're in the wrong church. Maybe the right church, wrong pew. I don't know. And then finally God got a hold of me, and he says, yeah, I want you to be a minister. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. And finally, I went to my pastor, and I'm like, Pastor Dennis, I feel like God's calling me to preach. He's like, whew, thank God. I was wondering how long it was going to take you to get it. And I'm like, God's telling everybody but me. So I thought it was impossible because seriously, when I would speak in front of people in school, like I never gave an oral uh, report in front of my class because every time I would start to, I'd get physically ill. I remember my, my eighth grade English teacher, Miss Brown, she saved, I was supposed to do a book report and I went in to do the book report and or I, I, I would stay home if I had to give a report. Like if I knew that I had to, I'd, I'd be home sick all day and literally sick, not just playing possum. I'd be like, oh my gosh. I can't do it. Well, this, this sweet, loving, amazing teacher, she decided to save my five minutes for the next day because she knew I'd be back the next day. So I get up in front of the class, and I, I, don't, I can't even tell you what the book report was on, but I can tell you what the feeling was when I stood up in front of the class because I, I looked down at the paper, everything went fuzzy, and I ran to the back of the room and into the trash can. And then I turned around and looked at her. I said, I'm going to call my mom. You can clean that up. Because I couldn't. So when God called me to preach, I'm like, What? You're crazy. God was telling me to do something that I could not physically do because I had this thing that would hold me back from physically doing it. And I remember the first time I stood up in front of a, the congregation after six months of cleaning the church. I'll tell you all this story on another time. Six months of cleaning the church and I stand up behind the pulpit and I'm standing there just like this. You know, and I said my, I had a whole page and a half of notes and I thought I did good, man. And I got through those page and a half of notes in seven and a half minutes. And then I stood there. There's probably about 90 people in the room, I think, somewhere in that area, 80, 90 people. And I'm standing there. I'm standing there. And God said, speak. I'm like, I have nothing else to say. He said, open your mouth and speak. So I just started to speak. And when, that, when I did that, when I surrendered, and I said, okay, God. And the Holy Spirit began to speak through me. And I actually preached a sermon. It was only about 11 minutes long. So it's 18 and a half minutes. But you know what? God moved in that 18 and a half minutes. Why? Because I was willing to do what I could not do. Because sometimes God calls you to do the impossible. And when he calls you to do the impossible, you've got to step up and go, all right, God, I'm going to do this thing, but you've got to give me the ability to do it. I remember when God called me to uh, youth ministry. I was in Peru. On a missions trip, God had to take me, you know, 2,000 miles away and put me around a bunch of teenagers, which I didn't like teenagers at the time. They all smelled bad and had bad attitudes. I love my teenagers now, even if they do smell bad and have bad attitudes. But God spoke to me. He said, he said I want you to minister to teens. I'm like, no, nah, not happening. And this was the only time I've ever audibly heard the voice of God, right? So God called me to do something not only did I uh, not want to do, but I couldn't do because they were scary Listen, I don't know if y'all know this about teenagers. Don't tell them I said this, but they're kind of scary sometimes, right? 
So the last one I want to get to is in John. And I think there's something specific about John, and I think it's amazing that John points this out because the three other gospels did not point this out. I don't know if y'all know this about the disciples, but they were always kind of competing. They always wanted to be at God's right hand, at Jesus' right hand. They always wanted to be the man, right? They wanted to be that right-hand person that Jesus, listen, I'm going to tell you a secret about being the right-hand person. It's not always the best place to be. But John, who refers to himself as the one who Jesus loved, he didn't have a complex, but he refers to himself as the one that Jesus loves. He says, he, he puts it in his gospel like this. It says, and after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up onto the mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes and then seeing that, what, that the, a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? But he said again, he said, feed them. Feed them. Sorry, I scrolled too far. You ever do that, Pastor? You scroll too far in your notes and you're like, where did I go? <laughs> he says, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said to the, this to test him, for he knew in himself what he would do. Philip answered to him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough. For each of them, one translation says eight months of laboring, we wouldn't have enough money to pay for all the food to feed these people. And then one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's, Andrew wasn't even important enough to just be Andrew. He had to be Simon Peter's brother. Like sometimes you just are known by the people you know, right? So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they to so many? He says, Jesus, what can you do with this? He says, so little, like it wouldn't even feed the 12 of us. What are you going to do with it? What is it so many? So we see it again. He says, he says, set them down. He took the bread. He took the fish, and he broke them, and he handed them out. Actually, he didn't hand them out. Jesus did not hand out the, the, the bread and the fish. He says he handed them to the disciples. Now, I kind of I kind of picture it happening like this. Jesus broke the first piece, and he hands it to, to, to Philip, and Philip takes the first piece out to the first group of 50, and he starts breaking off pieces, and as he breaks off a piece, it grows back out, and he breaks off pieces. And yeah, I, and, and I can imagine Philip going, whoa, so cool. You get a piece of bread? No, there's another one? Hold on and wait a minute. It never went away. And then all of a sudden, it says that they had more than enough to eat. It said they ate all they want. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I go to a buffet, man, they're going to regret letting me in the door for that $14.99. I'm getting my money's worth, right? So they ate all they could eat. And then he said, now go and collect the pieces. He said, go, let, go collect the leftover. And as they went and collected, there was 12 baskets worth. Now, I want to invite the band to come up at this time. How many of you want to know right now what it takes to be used in the miraculous of God? How many? I, I want to know. I, like, tell me, what does it take? There are two things that I get out of this story that tell me what I need to do to be used in the miraculous or to, to, to be a miracle in somebody's life. Listen, that boy didn't know what was about to happen. But he was close enough Get this, he was close enough to Jesus because he couldn't have been in the back of the crowd of 5,000 and heard that we were short on bread and food, okay? There's no way that he could have heard that and there's no way that Andrew would have known that there's a kid in the back of 5,000 people and let me tell you, that was just the men. Scholars believe there were anywhere from 20 to 30,000 people there at the moment because it said the, this was just counting the men because in Jewish culture, women didn't really count, I guess. I don't know, but... They didn't count the women and the children. So you figure if each man had his wife and one kid, we're at how many? What, 15,000 now, right? So, so he was close enough to hear what Jesus had to say, to know that there was a need, right? And then the second thing that we see is he was willing 
to give it all. He said, Jesus, I don't have much, but what I do have, you can have. He said, all of it, all of it. He didn't say, you know, let me keep a half a fish and a quarter of a loaf so that I can have me a fish sandwich. He saw the Messiah. He saw God. And God said, I need this. And he said, and let me tell you something. Jesus didn't actually need that boy to do that. He desired to use that young man as a miracle for 5,000 men and whoever else was there. Five loaves of bread. Listen, I don't know about y'all, but my family goes through five loaves of bread like that, right? And you got to figure, when we're talking about a loaf of bread at the time of Passover, it was a little flat piece of bread. It wasn't even like a good, you know, Sarah Lee white bread. It was like that flat. So that one little disc of bread probably didn't go very far, right? So the boy goes, I, this is all I've got, man. Say, Andrew, listen, buddy, I heard Jesus talking. What happened? He was in close enough proximity to where Jesus was to hear what the need was. So number one, we have to be in a proximity to God. That means we got to be on our, listen, you got to be listening. Because listen, God's not going to shout at you most of the time, unless you're me. He's not going to shout at you. He's not going to be like, hey, Pastor Dina. That was my horrible impression because I'm starting to lose my voice. He's not going to be like, hey, Pastor Dina, go give so-and-so. No, he's going to say it in such a way that you got to be listening. You gotta be listening. You gotta be in proximity to Jesus to hear what He wants, what He needs you to do. And listen, He doesn't really need you to do it. He desires to use you in a miraculous way. The second thing, and this is the hard part, you have to be willing to surrender all. You have to be like, listen, Jesus, whatever it is you need. Whatever you want from me, whatever you desire from me. And listen, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna ask some of y'all to say a prayer in just a few minutes amongst yourselves. And the altar team's gonna be down front to pray with you in just a few minutes. But let's do a math equation really quickly. Five and two. So we got five and two divided by 5,000. It's not gonna go very far, is it? So you take five loaves and two fish, you break that up amongst 5,000 people, everybody might get a crumb, right? They might get a scale of the fish if they're lucky, right? But if you take those same five and those same two and you add the power of God, you add Jesus to the equation, all of a sudden that little bit becomes a whole lot. Not only because it does it become enough, but if we look, it becomes more than enough. Listen, I don't know how many times over the years that I've heard people tell me, Pastor, what I've got isn't enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not worthy. Shh. Listen, that's not an untrue statement. We're not worthy. But Jesus. We're not worthy, but the blood of Christ. Because we've been purchased with a price where we're in a place where we have exchanged our filthy rags for his glory. If you know Christ as your Savior. It says it in Corinthians, it says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might be his righteousness. You're gonna get it wrong every now and then. Heck, if you're like me, you get it wrong a lot until you get it right. If we're being honest. So when we take our little time, our little talent, our little testimony, and our little treasure, and we say, God, I've only got this little bit, but God, have all of me. Have all of me. He takes that little bit and he makes it so much. I don't know how many times I've spoke to somebody and I say, hey, listen, this is what I was dealing with. And they're like, oh my gosh, that blessed me so much. I don't know how many times I, God said, spoke to me in that still quiet voice to go and do something for somebody that, that they can't do anything back for me. And that person tells me that they were running from God or they, 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 they lost faith in God. And all of a sudden my, my $5 Happy Meal made them realize that God still loves them. He can take your little bit, but you have to do this. You have to say, God, all of me. 
You have to say all of me. God, take it all because I want to be used in the miraculous. I, and listen, what may seem miraculous, somebody else may not seem miraculous to you, but when God's using you, it's going to bless them so much. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you to evaluate yourself. Go back to that scale that they gave you at the beginning, one to 10. Where are you at? Maybe you're on the lower end of that scale and you're saying, God, I need to be on that upper end of that scale. All of me, God. Lord, use me. But listen, I'm going to warn you, when you pray this prayer, God's going to give you opportunities to be used by him. And you listen, he's not going to... He's going to give you opportunities to step into his miraculous. And you have to step because until you step, until you step, he's not going to give you the next thing. Many times we miss what God wants to do because we still haven't done the last instruction he gave us. God said, I want you to get rid of this. And, and, and six months later, you're like, God, why aren't you using me? He's like, well, you're still holding on to this. When you say all of me, you've got to mean all of me, right? The other thing we're going to do this morning is I'm going to say, if you're in here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's your day. Today's the day to say, Jesus, come into my life. Take all of me. I exchange all of me for all of you because trust me, that is a much better deal. It's a much better deal. Yes, following Jesus is not always easy. Not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be safe. It's not meant to be sanitized. It's meant to be dirty. It's meant to be hard. It's meant to be bloody. You're saying, come into my heart, Jesus. Take my life. Listen, I don't need you to lead you in some prayer for that. But I'm going to ask you, if, the, if you're in either of those categories, you're saying, God, I need you to take all of me. I want you to pray. Hit your knees wherever you are. Stand up. Put your hands in the air. Say, Jesus, take all of me. And the, the prayer team's about to come down in just a moment. I'll be down. The prayer team will be down. And, and the other thing we do here is we invite you to take part in celebrating the body and the blood that was broken and poured out for us. There's stations in the back on either side that have the communion elements. And we say, Lord, this is your body. This is your blood. It was broken. It was poured out so that I could be made clean, so that I could be made whole, so that I could be used. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet this morning. The worship team is going to do one more set, and we're going to, I want you to worship. Listen, you don't need one of us to pray for you at the altar come to the altar. Gosh, come to the altar this morning. Come to the altar and say all of me. Maybe you've been saved for years and you're, you're in that place where you're jaded. You're saying, you know, I've been doing this for years. It's the same thing. Come to the altar. Say, God, all of me, wherever I'm broken, wherever I'm hurt, wherever I've missed it, come all of me, God. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We honor you for what you're doing in this place this morning, God, that you would use each of us, God, that we would surrender everything to you. And Father, we praise you in Jesus' mighty and matchless name.